Library. Uh, my name is Kim Christensen. I'm the Dean Services Librarian here, and I'm so happy to see everybody here from all over the place, too, I think, since this is the only Pennsylvania stop that you guys are making. I'm so honored. Um, <laughs> um, there's a couple of people I just want to thank. Um, Heather back there from Children's Book World. Thank you, Heather. <laughs> and we're um, selling these books back there for everybody. 20% uh, does go back to the library, so. Always a good thing for us. Um, also, Heather from the middle school and Amy from the high school. Yay for putting the word out there. It's always nice when the schools and the libraries and the bookstores all work together to get books out to kids, especially teens. Uh, we're a hard, you're a hard age group sometimes. Um, so without further ado, I just want to introduce. Uh, I just want to welcome our authors, but I'm going to introduce Courtney from McMillan. She's going to tell you about um, the schedule for the afternoon. So thank you. Thank you very much for coming. We're really happy to be here. Um, first I'm just going to introduce each author and then they're going to tell you a little bit about their book and why they wrote it and then we'll open it up to you guys for questions um, for the signing. So first we have Marie Rikowski, author of Shadow Society. <laughs> Author of the Birthmark Trilogy. Lee Bardugo, author of Shadow and Bone. Uh, and Jennifer Alvin, author of Cruel. <laughs> so, Marie, if you want to take it away. Okay, so not just what the book is about, but why I wrote it. Yes. Okay. So uh, this is the Shadow Society. It is about a girl who discovers she's not human and belongs to an alternative world where the Great Chicago Fire never happened, and deadly creatures called Shades terrorize the human population. It's an urban fantasy, paranormal. It's a Romeo and Juliet romance, style romance. Um, and I guess I'm going to interpret that question: Why did you write it as? what was the idea behind the, the story. Um, the first line of the novel is, knowing what I know now, I say my foster mother had her reasons for throwing a kitchen knife at me. <laughs> and this um, was inspired by a real life event. Um, a friend of mine when he was in high school in the midst of a huge argument with his mother, um, when, this, when this was happening, his mom um, threw a knife at him. It didn't hit him, it hit the fish tank and, and it broke it. Uh, and she claimed to this day that she did not throw the knife at him, it was all an accident, she was just gesticulating wildly in the midst of <laughs> arguing with her rebellious son, um, but he, he thinks he knows the truth. Um, and that it was intended for him. In any event, I, uh, I was intrigued, as one might be, by such a violent story. And wonder, you know, why did the mom throw the knife? Did she really mean to do it or not? In the process of asking these questions, I wondered, well, what if I were to tell a story where the reason why the knife did not hit its intended target, what if that reason were a paranormal one? What if it was something otherworldly? And I came up with the idea of shade. Um, a shade is a new paranormal creature that I invented that can become uh, incorporeal at will. So not just invisible, but just physically vanished is gone, um, and which makes them pretty powerful. Not invulnerable because they are uh, vulnerable to fire. It's connected to the Great Chicago Fire Story, but I've said enough already, and I'm going to pass it on. There you go. I want to read that book. Where can I get it? <laughs> I'm Cara O'Brien, and I wrote the Birthmarks trilogy. In Birthmarks, Gaia Stone is a midwife whose job it is to take babies, well, deliver them with the mothers, and then take the newborns and hand them over to authorities who live on the other side of the wall. It's set 400 years in the future in a dystopian society after climate change, and the people inside the wall still have computers and technology, while the people outside live in something closer to medieval conditions. 
And by the time Guy gets back home the first night after she's delivered this baby, um, she finds her parents have been arrested, so she spends the rest of the book trying to save her parents. And um, I was really interested in writing this project, partly because I would really like to think about the future. How many of you like to think about the future and wonder what it will be like? I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not scared. We're going to find solutions, and our children will find solutions, and their children will find solutions. Yes, she's nodding back. I'm, we are okay. We are friends now. We are friends, <laughs> and our children will survive. Will survive. I like to think about it, and <laughs> we have to. We don't have a choice about it. Positive, <laughs> friends, positive. I'm so glad we're here. <laughs> yeah, it's true. So I was trying to think about who would the survivors be um, 400 years from now, and I thought they would get some things right and get some things wrong, and they would be doing whatever mistakes they made policies with good reasons at heart. Um, taking babies away from mothers when they're newborn is really not something I think is a good thing. So I wanted to find out why that was the case, and I wrote the rest of the book to figure out how the society was working. In the second book of the trilogy, there are three. It's a, a trilogy, so there are three books in the trilogy. <laughs> and in the second book... <laughs> You know, we should write each other while we're in the <laughs> We've been traveling together for five days now, and we're really good friends with each other, and we don't tell nasty secrets about each other, even though it's really tempting. I'm sure I don't know what you mean. You know, we should decide beforehand, maybe, that we are going to, like, just I don't think, think we, we should go to the whole time. time. <laughs> Actually, we should stage, like, a, a public... A, a flying... Fight. Yes. A rumble. A rumble. <laughs> You guys didn't hear it though. It's all going to be very spontaneous. I'm going to get up as, as some books where you throw on the table. I think those human sacrifice. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I may not be ready for this change. <laughs> where was I? Uh, in book two, two, Guy goes to a second dystopian society where the men outnumber the women nine to one, but the women are in charge. And there are some strict social rules, for instance, men and women are not supposed to touch unless they're married, and kissing is a crime, which causes some problems. And the other problems going on in this society are environmental, actually. If you, the number of children who are baby girls has decreased, they're not being born, and anyone who tries to leave this environment dies on their way out of town. So it's an environmental trap, and with all of these constraints on it, people are really under pressure. When Gaia arrives there, she is naturally precious because she's a girl, and one of the one of the young men from the previous book shows up. He is already worthless, and it's an interesting reversal of some of the um, power structures that happened in the first book. That was interesting to me. The third book, Promises of the Internet, has been recently released, and in this one, Gaia returns to the original setting, bringing 2,000 refugees with her. Uh, they still need water and yet conditions in the enclave have worsened in the time that she's been gone, so she has to try to persuade them to give the refugees the resources that they need. But people inside the wall are now experimenting on mothers from outside the wall. And there's a price on Gaia's head, and things are very, very fast. Very, very bad. <coughs> and I feel sure I have said enough, so I'm going to pass things along to my esteemed colleague, Lee Bardugo. Lee. <laughs> Thank you, Tara. Um, so, uh, I'm Lee Bardugo. I wrote Shadow and Bone. Um, I used to be a makeup and special effects artist. And the thing about being a makeup artist, when Halloween rolls around, as it is going to do soon, um, uh, Halloween sort of stops being fun because you end up doing a lot of work for free. And um, uh, a few Halloweens ago, I was staying with some friends in the mountain and on the mount in the mountains and. Um, I had offered to do makeup for the hosts who were hosting this party, and they had invited a ton of people and said, guess what, the makeup artist is coming, and you can all get your makeup done. So while everybody else was at the Halloween party, I was doing makeup. And the next night, I was really cranky, and everybody else went to town, and I decided to stay behind and read. And I fell asleep alone in this house in the mountains, and when I woke up, it was completely dark. And um, I am from L.A. It didn't really get that dark in L.A. This was country dark, where you can't see your hand in front of your face. And I'm in this unfamiliar house, and I am stumbling around looking for a light switch, and suddenly completely sure that while I was asleep, somebody snuck into the house, 
you know, and then waited for me to wake up before they attacked me. But I'm sure that there's something else in the dark with me. And um, I'm getting more and more panicked. And, and, and finally, I, I get together. I find a light switch. I'm standing there, you know, with my heart pounding. I check all of the closets, lock all of the doors, and I go to bed. And I'm lying there, and I'm thinking about it. And I'm like, well, what if there were no light switches? What if darkness was a place? What if the monsters you imagine lurking there under the bed in the closet, you know, in the darkened parking lot when you're fumbling for your keys. But if they were there and they were more horrifying than anything you'd ever picture, how would you fight them on this territory? Why would you fight them? Why would you need to cross this territory? And um, this idea of darkness as a place became the shadow pool, which in Shadow and Bone is this swath of nearly impenetrable darkness crawling with monsters that feast on human flesh. And once I created this place, I had to ask the question, you know, why would you go there, once you know that there's a swath of near impenetrable darkness crawling with human monsters who feast on human flesh, you don't build a vacation home there. It does sound fun. Um, so I had to figure out why would they have to cross it. And as it turns out, this um, fold has torn this country in two. It separated uh, everybody in it from their ports and their harbors. Um, and in order for them to trade with the outside world, to get finished goods and ammunition to fight the wars raging on their borders, they have to cross the shadow fold. And they do this with a really big army of serfs, because serfs are basically cannon fodder. They're expendable. And one of these serfs is Alina Starkov, who is an orphan and a refugee who was raised in the home of a duke. The only person she's ever had to rely on is her best friend, Mal, who is another uh, orphan and refugee. Although that's sort of changing, because since they were drafted into the army, Mal's kind of a rising star. He's popular, he's good looking, he's uh, really good at his job. And Alina is not. And she is fading further into the background every day. But all of that changes when the regiment is attacked on the shadow fold and Alina reveals a power that could be the secret to saving this country and destroying the fold. And she is whisked away to a little palace to train to be a member of the kingdom's magical elite, the Grisha. And there she meets the Darkling, who is the most powerful Grisha of them all, and has some secrets of his own. So, um, that's the story of Shadow and Bone. Jennifer? Yeah, that wasn't very useful. Sorry, over to you, Jennifer. It's the separation of the... I know. It's the Shadow Soul. It's just like this in the book. When are the flesh-eating creatures coming to the world? Hi, I'm Jennifer Alvin, and I wrote Cruel, and it is the first of a trilogy, and it just came out on Tuesday, so if you've never heard of it, that's probably why. Um, I actually came up with the idea for Cruel uh, from a painting that I studied in a class in college, and it was actually an English class. And a book we were reading referenced this painting, and the professor brought it in, and I immediately became obsessed with this painting. And in the painting, there are these girls, and they're sitting in a tower, and they're all circling the tower, and they're all embroidering. And there's a figure watching over them, and these strings coming up through the center of the tower, presumably whatever it is they're embroidering. And then from the windows of the tower, the fabric that they're embroidering is flowing out and becoming the world. So there's ships and lands and people on it. And if you look really closely at the painting, one of the girls is doing something different that she's not supposed to. All these other girls are doing their work and this girl is different. And I love this painting and I, I told people about it all the time. And this was probably much longer ago than I want to think about. Ten years? Nine years? Um, and one day I just saw it. Uh, I saw this book on my bookshelf and I thought of that painting and I'd been working on another novel and I sat down and I wrote a prologue and it begins with this girl talking about how she's been sent off to test to work the looms that they use to weave and embroider the world that she lives in. And all 16-year-old girls have to do this, and it's considered a position of great power to become a spinster, because these are beautiful femme fatales who get all of the best clothes, and they live in luxury, and they have a certain amount of power that 
no other woman in the country has because the rest of them are assigned certain roles. But Adelie Lewis, our heroine, has been taught by her parents to hide the fact that she has this ability. And they've practiced it every night for five years. And they've taken her every night and tried to convince her that she can <coughs> manipulate time. And she does on her last day of testing by accident. And she hopes she gets away with it. Um, and as the story opens in the first chapter, she's sitting at the table with her parents knowing that they're likely coming for her in the night, as they always do, and not wanting to tell them while they're trying to celebrate that she's been released from testing. Long story short, she gets swept away to the tower and gets into all of the politics and power plays and starts to unravel the deadliest secret of all. <laughs> That was great. Thank you, guys. Um, so we want to open it up to you and see if anyone has questions for the authors. We have special prizes for the first two questions. Yes. Go ahead. Um, how long did it take you to write the book? Um, the Shadow and the Oh. Um, it's from idea to going out with it into the world, taking it to agents. It took me a little, a little less than a year, um, with some time to research in it. Um, yeah. Um. Um. Why did you want to stay back and read? Well, I was, honestly, I was furious with the people who had brought me there. Like, they were all like, come on, we'll go to the town, we'll take it for drinks. And I was like, I don't want to be anywhere near you people. Like, I was like, I was exhausted and I was done. I was feeling cranky. I wanted to, fit. I don't even remember what book I was reading, which is kind of a shame. But if you um, saw the amount, the kind of makeup she does, and it is intense, like movie <laughs> magic, awesome. I can only imagine how much time you put into. I don't mind when it gets paid. Stop getting paid. They were like, I need her to put on the mountain. And you were like, I won't. What prizes do they get? Oh, we have, um, we want to see our, we want to know, books that are coming out this winter. So we have Scarlet, which is the sequel to Cinder, um, and I Remembered by Jessica Barbie. So those that you two can fight it out. Yeah. Throw it in the middle. Cornucopia. Yeah, I've been following the tour on Twitter and Facebook, and I know you guys must be completely delirious. After, oh, after um, <laughs> traveling so much, just so you guys know, we announced it on um, on Twitter that if anybody used the word delirious in a question, you would get a surprise. Oh, I'll come yeah. afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> but so I know you guys, you know, must be tired and everything. But what's one of your highlights from the tour so far? You guys seem like you have tons of fun together. <laughs> I want to know where's drinks after this. She's kind of like that. I know. I know. I know. I don't 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 know. So, so we were in the car last night, in the dark, um, driving back to Memphis from, from Oxford, Mississippi. And I don't know exactly, I think it was Cara who was just sort of humming to yeah. herself very prettily. And then I don't know who started it, but we just decided that we should be singing. We should all be singing. And together. Together. And we sang rounds, we sang songs from our childhood, we sang um, Brian Adams songs. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it was, it was really special. Yeah. I don't know how Courtney and the driver felt. <laughs> 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 Probably like this is the longest car ride ever. The driver made a request at one point. It was about black birds. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the people who came with us were very nice. I think they and it was so unexpected. I don't know how many how many times do you drive around in a car with your friends and all start singing. 
And I'm going to say that she's not doing anything either. So we're in a minivan singing songs like we're 11. <laughs> it's awesome. Everyone says, <laughs> they tell you, you know, tour, it's not sleep, it's not, you know, it's not a, a sleepover, it's, it's work, it's hard work, blah, blah, blah. And we're like, yeah, it is a sleepover! <laughs> 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 hey, it's a sleepover! I'm going to put glitter eyeshadow on you! Like, you know, so, Jen might cut my bang. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, what do you think? Should she be talking about it? I don't know if yeah. that I think she should. Maybe we, we can call you. We can call you. <laughs> 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 Thing. This is the important hard hitting questions we ask on this, you know, yeah. the day of tour. It has been really fun. It is really fun. I don't really have a lot of time to do it anymore. Yeah. And and the thing is, you you know, when when you can't when I've been on deadline I've had to turn down a lot of shoots and then you refer somebody and then they're the person they go to first. But to be totally honest, as much as I love having this skill and I actually love it when my friends call me up and are like, Hey, I wanna be, you know, Lady Gaga from the Bad Romance video, and I can be like, I happen to have 12 pairs of lashes, let's do this thing. You know, like, I, I love that, but um, I don't miss being on my feet 12 hours a day, and I don't miss listening to some model talk about the cleanse that she's on, and I just, I mean, this is what I always wanted to do, so I'll miss it. Um, in the book, you um, um, drew a map of the um, place. Um, why did you draw the map? Well, first I should tell you that I didn't draw the map in my book, but Cara did draw the map in hers, and it is mind-blowingly um, gorgeous and detailed, so I'm very impressed. Um, <laughs> and you should check it out. It kind of looks like a rose almost, the way that city is. Kind of, that's just how the, it's how the city naturally grew. Well, I just wrote down, you know, I just copied what was there. Um, I drew a map while I was writing the book because I am... Um, I, lo I couldn't keep track of where I was. Um, the town started to multiply, and I needed a sense for how far they were from things because I needed to know, you know, is it going to take them a week to travel the distance? Is it going to take them two weeks? Do they need to be on horseback? That kind of thing. This was a, a not a very well-drawn map because I really have no artistic skills. Um, but then this kind of cool thing happened where um, they decided to include a map, and they said, well, what if we did a map sort of like the one on Leviathan? I don't know if you guys have read that. It's Scott Westerfeld. It's really fun. It's really good. Um, the kind of steampunk retelling of um, World War One, but um, and I was like, that's fantastic. I love that map. I love the artist. You know, and they said, well, what if we got um, that artist to do it? What if we got Keith Thompson to do it? At which point, I was like, okay, that sounds amazing. <laughs> and then I wrote him an incredibly gushy email that I still regret sending. But um, yeah, so so that's why there's a map, and, and it seems to help people figure out where they are in the story. So. Well, there's also a couple of spoilers in there on that map. <laughs> <laughs> How much say are you going to have in the Shadow and Bone movie? And do you think you'll ever have the chance to... You should get to do makeup on one of the actors. <laughs> yeah, sure. Seriously. I actually wouldn't mind consulting on it. I don't want to do the makeup. Because makeup artists are the first to come and the last to leave. They have to be there to take uh -huh. the makeup off the actors. Um, but, uh, but I wouldn't mind consulting because I hate... I hate when I'm watching a movie and I'm like, she's in the middle of a war zone. Why is she wearing mascara? <laughs> but um, uh, I don't, I don't know how much say I will have in the movie. Um, I was lucky enough to meet with one of the producers um, a little while ago, and um, everybody has seemed uh, uh, really wonderful about the book. I mean, I really trust the people who kind of have it in their hands, and they they seem like they actually want to talk about the story with me, which is nice. Um, and the rest of it will be up to them, really. So it won't be like that Percy Jackson movie where everything was wrong? <laughs> Thomas, Thomas. Um, uh, yeah. oh, that comes up a lot, really. Enough. Um, I, I can't, I can't, again, I don't, I'm, an, I'm a new author. This book has been out less than, I think, like five months. Um, so I don't know how much they all get. Um, probably not a whole lot, but again, the amazing thing is that when it was optioned, it was optioned by, if I could have handpicked two people to take control of this film, it would have been DreamWorks and David Heyman, and, and there they are. So I don't quite know how I lucked into that, but um, I, I feel really good about it, so fingers crossed. And I have another question. Yes. Do you know if the movie will be live action or animated? Live action. Live action. Live action. If the film gets made, which depends largely on how the books do. So, everybody, um, so, um, it will be live action, not really.
Does anyone um, here an inspiring author? Do you guys want to share something? Liar. I'm learning. I write fan fiction for some stories, and I'm really upset because there is no pre-show thing on fan fiction. So I'm like, I don't email them. I'm begging them. They don't listen to me. <laughs> We're very upset by that. Got it. I will get on it. Don't you wait Yeah. I know, so I'm like, add it now. I'm emailing what you're doing, because I want to know. <laughs> so, yeah, we're both kind of writing, and I'm currently doing something called the one-year adventure novel, where you make your own novel, and you might get it published by that company. And I have no clue how it's going, because I've never written a novel before. Well, neither have I. I finished that one. I've played all of them. But, in um... Uh, Marie has a kind of a parallel universe slash alternate history or something going in, which I was decided it's really cool. Um, well, um, I don't know how many people know this outside of the Chicagoland area, but we all knew it. Yeah. Um, do you know the song about Mrs. O'Leary? Yeah. And the Great Chicago Fire? Mm-hmm. And how supposedly the cow kicked Lamb over mm-hmm. and that's how the fire started. Um, when I was in graduate school, a friend of mine um, in the program gave a, a talk on how this legend was entirely fake. Um, that it's basically anti-Irish uh, xenophobia. Um, and because there were so many Irish immigrants at that time, uh, there was just blame placed upon them for something that they, they didn't do. Nobody knows how the Great Chicago Fire started. Um, and for this book, I reimagine the start of the Great Chicago Fire as actually a genocide that what had happened was that humans had tried, and in our world, succeeded in killing every single shade. Um, And so, in this alternate world, um, the Great Chicago Fire never happened. Shades do exist, and shades and humans are constantly at war with one another. Um, And I mentioned that there's a sort of Romeo and Juliet uh, romance, and you can guess, I suppose, how that works out. One is a shade, one is a human, and um, one, of the, one of the things that the book's about is how they are able to um, both, both resolve the, the problems um, between their people and also between each other. I want to read that book. Did you have a question? This is sort of a general question. I always wonder this about authors. Um, do you ever have like false starts when you write your novels? Like, do you get really good ideas? And you're like, oh, this is going to be the best book ever. You start writing and writing and get like 20 pages in, and then it just doesn't work. Or do you more start and just go with it? Did you hear this guess? You didn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so when I was introducing this book, I said that I sat down and wrote the prologue, which is pretty much intact. And then um, there was a tragedy with a glass of water in my knife book. But uh, I spent a couple of weeks or months working on this kind of high fantasy, very gritty, rustic version of this book. And at the end of that, I looked at this, you know, I don't know, I probably read 50 to 100 pages. I mean, a significant chunk of change. And went, this is not what I want this book to be at all. And it was a total fail. There were like multiple viewpoints and everything was, and I just totally re-envisioned it. I mean, it's, it's science fiction in a futuristic, like, Mad Men-esque world. You just so, right up yeah. stuff that you I did. I did. I kept the wow. character names and that was it. I had a Joss and an Adelaide and that was it. Everything else did. Everything else went. And, just went. and it's hard to do, but it was the right decision. So, um, Yeah, I, I had uh, I had a lot of uh, the first two chapters of a lot of things going, and the only thing I promised myself, and even when I got the idea for this book, I thought to myself, well, it's going to be one more thing you start and don't finish. <laughs> and I was like, no. <laughs> like, I'm like, this is going to be, I'm going to finish this, and even if it's complete crap, at least I'll have finished a book, and then the next one will be good. This one doesn't have to be good. And I sort of tricked myself into writing this book. Every day I would sit down, and that sort of voice would come on and be like, you know, 
everything you're doing is awful. It's terrible. Who would ever want to read that? And instead of being like, no, it's not, I would be like, you are right. Luckily, no one will ever see it. Um, you know, and I told myself, when it's done, you can put it in a desk drawer, you can set fire to it, whatever you want to do to it. Um, okay, maybe that is extreme. But um, you can do whatever you want to it, but you just have to finish. Just finish, just finish, just finish. And that's really the advice I give anybody who's working on um, their first book, is that don't be precious about it. Get out of your own way. Shut that editor up and just plow through. Get a beginning, middle, and end on the page, and you can go back and pull it apart and make it something good. You are going to murder a lot of darlings. You know, you're going to have to get rid of a lot of stuff. But it's not that painful once you have that beginning, middle, and end on the page. I don't think. It's kind of fun to destroy things. <laughs> I agree. I think there's a lot of destruction. Um, and I also find that each book does a different thing. Uh, after I wrote Birthmark, I thought, well, I got to that. That's okay. Writing the second book will be, you know, it'll have some challenges too, but it'll be all right. And I wrote about 450 pages, and it was really hard. First drafts are super hard for me. And one of my earliest conversations with my editor about it was like, um, we, we talked for a while, and I thought we were kind of understanding some of the vision of what was going on in the book. She said, well, you might want to reconsider the last 100 pages, <laughs> which translated to me, you know, once you cut those and add something else to the end. And then she said, why don't you reconsider the first 100 pages, too? So that was great because it really freed me to throw out huge numbers of scenes and, and focus on the stuff that was working. That was the messiest book that I had to write, but in the end, after my 12 drafts, it was a book that I was really excited about. So for me, it's kind of like getting out of my own way. I have to allow myself to write stuff that's not going to be right. It's going to really be wrong. But I can't get to the stuff that's right until I write the wrong stuff first. So that's what I do. I just write really messy first drafts. And, you know, it's hard, but I, I love it, too. And the revision really makes me Oh, fun to answer to you. I don't, I mean, I never miss anything that I throw away, so I forget that it's gone, and I forget that it's ever there. Um, I think something that's interesting to me about the process of uh, writing and what changes is um, that I've learned not to try to force things. Um, the novel that I'm editing now that's coming out uh, next fall is just called The Winner's Curse. Initially, I thought it was going to be one book, and I was trying to write a certain kind of end. And um, usually I have an idea of where I'm going, where the end's going to be. I know the last line. I knew the last line, the last few lines of this book um, pretty early on. In this case, I didn't. And, it was, uh, and I was finding it hard as I was getting closer towards what I thought was the end. And I realized it was because I was forcing my characters into an unnatural ending. And that was not the way this situation could go. Um, so I think that uh, maybe rather than thinking about what, um, what I threw away that I already began, I guess it is one way of managing it. But I, I gave up a certain kind of preconceived idea of what my story should be in favor of in a respect for the organic way of evolving. There was a yeah, um, um, question for everyone. Why, why did you choose young adult as opposed to for an adult novel? And two, who are your favorite mm-hmm. I answer to both questions. I don't know if that's the one answer to both of this. Go for it, it's for me. <laughs> um, I did a lot of English classes in college and grad school. I was focused on getting my PhD in literature. And midway through school, I encountered this book series that you probably haven't heard of. It's called Harry Potter. <laughs> no one's, I know no one's ever heard of it. Yeah. I have to like, write it down for people. Um, and my then boyfriend, now husband, had been reading them and devouring them, saying now, late, 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 and sitting in the lounge and reading them. And I thought, he is nuts. Why is he reading these books that are for children? And then one day I picked one up 
and it was actually finals week, and I had papers due. I was an English major. I had, you know, 20-page papers due and finals and tests. I think I was actually taking biology, too, which is a whole other story. Um, and uh, at that time, there were four of the books out, and I read every single one of them that week. I mean, I literally just stayed up and read them all. I'm a very fast reader, but still. I mean, it was like three days of my life just devoted to devouring Harry Potter. And for the first time in forever, despite the fact that I was doing literature degrees, I remembered why I loved books. What that magical thing was, that quality that made it that I was always upstairs in my room reading during the summer instead of being outside, because I'm more of an indoor girl. But, um... J.K. Rowling just opened that whole world to me, and while this is more of a young adult novel, I kind of see it the same way. Once she, once she opened that door, I kind of peeked in a little further, and I started discovering more young adult books and more books for middle grade, and I was so excited by what other authors are doing, and it's amazing to me how genres are being mashed and we get to create these whole new worlds and there's not the same rules for adult books. I just think it's the most exciting genre to be writing and the people are awesome. I mean, he is what do But no, I love, I just, I can't imagine. I think someday I might write an adult book. There's books that are, it's like right now I just am very, very blessed to be writing for. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wrote the best book I possibly could. It had a 15-year-old protagonist. It was a young adult novel, and I just was really having a great time. I think it, I think it was probably influenced by my students. I was teaching ninth grade English at the time, and I was really enjoying Twilight and how fast it was, the pace of it was just hysterically fun. It was clear to me that Stephanie Meyer had had a ball writing the books, and I wanted to have fun too. So I, I really was trying to write the best thing I could, and I didn't, I didn't think about um, people being younger than me or older than me or anything. I just had fun. And the young adult books that I like a lot right now, I, I, it's sort of whatever is my most recent read is my favorite. I, I just finished. Um, Breeze, and I really just, you know, I just devoured it. It was really great. I like Patrick Ness's Camp Walking series. I like um, Chip Baker by Paula Bacigalupi. I just read Partials by Dan Brown. I read The New Normal by Trish mm-hmm. Dollar. Pardon me? Jen Wells? Jen Wells. Jen Wells. Jen Wells. Jen Wells. Yeah. Wrong Dan? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. So sort of whatever comes to me. I love reading it up young adult, though. I read it. That's, what I, that's my preferred genre of reading, for sure. So, um, my first novel, The Cabinet of Wonder, um, was inspired by a legend about the clock in the center of Prague. Um, legend has it that the man who commissioned the clock had the eyes and then he made it gouged out so that he could never build anything like it again. And it was a story that stuck with me for a long time, um, in part because my mother went blind when she was a child and has struggled with um, her vision ever since she's had many operations. She can see now, but, you know, she's told me that she knows that most likely one day she will again be blind. So um, when I thought about this legend and I thought about the idea of writing about it, it seemed natural to me not to write about the man, but to write about his daughter. And that's why I initially started to write a YA book. And I wrote about a 12-year-old girl named Petra who's in a sort of similar situation except that the Prince of Bohemia this is a world of magic. And the Prince of Bohemia has actually installed the eyes that he can wear them whenever he likes. So the book's about her mission to run away to Prague and steal her father's eyes back. Um, and so it was really just the idea I had, it was like Hara, the idea I had was suited for a younger audience. Um, and my favorite things that I've read recently um, are probably Cozy and Verity by the Sublime. Um, I also love the Where Things Come Back by Corey Whaley. I always love Megan Whale and Turner's books. I read them constantly. Um, and now I'm. Uh, I, I love 
<laughs> She's been a joy to read. It's fun. It's really fun to be talking about her books too, and to you know, hear about what inspired certain moments. Yeah, we'll be like walking along and we talk about Mal. You know, like the people we all oh well, we all know these people. Really fun. It's when we has really nice visual aids. <laughs> yeah, her friend makes these amazing um, magazine covers with very cute guys. There's been some nice fan art. Um, yeah, I guess um, favorite authors. I don't. Um, I guess Diana Wynne Jones um, uh, is an all-time favorite of mine. Um, George R. R. Martin, obviously not YA, but. Um, when I read the first three books in the uh, Song of Ice and Fire series, I didn't write for two months because I was like, really, why bother? <laughs> There's no point. Um, <laughs> and uh, um, who else? Um, I love Neil Gaiman. Um, right now I'm reading The Magicians by Love Grossman, um, also not my age. Um, I try to, I don't, I, when I'm working, I don't tend to read a lot of um, fantasy or uh, young adult. I tend to be reading nonfiction, usually stuff for research. Um, but, uh, sorry, what was your question? Why do I write for young adults? Oh, um, you know, I, I think the decisions you make when you're, people always talk about it in terms of metaphor, like, you know, that these are, you know, that, that, that fantasy and the kind of stuff we see in YA is, is somehow metaphorical, that, that, you know, that this is how teenagers feel, that their lives are in peril. Well, the truth is, your lives are in peril. Like, every time, <laughs> right now. No, but I mean, our, the decisions we make when we're 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, they are really important. And there's a lot of stuff that can go wrong. And things are very intense. And I don't think that that's imagined. I think it's real. And I think that... Um, particularly in fantasy, you have the opportunity to express that in different ways. And I also think, like, you know, it's a time of first. It's when you first encounter the world and you um, really begin to understand what it is to be different and how the world treats different people. Um, it's when you really have to start to establish what your principles are and what you're willing to do for them. It's when you fall in love for the first time. And, frankly, you never fall in love that way again because you don't have your armor up. You know, you develop that over time. So, to me, it's just an incredibly um, powerful, scary time. And I guess also, you know, uh, you make different decisions when you're 16 than when you're 36, or you should. Um, and, I, and I think it's more interesting right now for me to write about those. But these were the, you know, again, I wanted to write about people who were coming into um, conflict with this world for the first time. So that's why I didn't have to YA. But... I don't worry too much about genre. I think that's sort of, um, I, I mean, if I had worried more about genre, I probably wouldn't have written this book because when I was, when I went out to query agents, nobody was looking for high fantasy. Nobody wanted secondary worlds. Um, and I was lucky to find people who were interested. And then it turned out that, that some people wanted something different. And, and but that was all good fortune, you know. And uh, you have to write the book that you would want to read. and. and and that you would feel passionate about it as a reader. I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, Jennifer, this is a question for you about cruel. A student um, at the nearby high school had actually asked me why you spell the word cruel that way for the title. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I think it's a term that has something to do with the weaving in the book, so maybe it has a double meaning. But I'm not, I don't think she's here, so I thought I would ask and try to get a okay. title for her. You're right. <laughs> yeah, that's what you should do. I was right. I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> um, cruel is a term that is actually cruel or cruel work, and it's a form of embroidery that's fairly realistic and involves like a certain style of knotting. Um, and for you, ask, I don't do this form of embroidery. A lot of people ask me if I'm embroidering. Don't. Um, it's beautiful. I just I write. <laughs> but I loved the term because it's obviously a double entendre for cruel. Um, and the main, one of the main characters is a crueler, so she has the power to embellish the fabric of life that everyone else weaves. So she's embroidering it. Um, so that's where the title came from. So it is a sewing term. You were totally correct. I found it in a thesaurus. I can't claim that. I was just like, I know all these amazing sewing terms. I spent a lot of time doing random research with like 
the better at homes and gardens look at sewing. <laughs> Our research shows that it can be really different. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to see some Russian food. Oh, do you really? No. I got all excited. <laughs> <laughs> like, maybe you have. I know, but maybe you have a recipe. I don't have. Um, there's one last question. Uh, well, this is the first two ways, and then kind of the second part is for all of you. Um, first of all, I just have to say the dark ones. Um, yeah. <laughs> everybody knows. Um, Not everybody. Well, that's yeah, yeah. the rest of the scene. You know what I'm talking about. Um, when you envision them, who do you think? Uh, um, look, I'll be honest. First of all, anybody I could pick for actual casting would be too old by the time they made the movie. And and I think it's probably for the best that I don't have pictures of 14-year-old boys on my laptop. Like, it's just not a, you know, something to keep in mind. But he's supposed to be, you know, um, he's in his early 20s. Or he's, he looks like he's in his early 20s. Um, but, uh, and it's tough because he has to look... You know, he's spectacular looking, but he also has to have um, the gravitas to make you believe that he can lead armies and conquer worlds. Um, so, yeah, I will say that um, that I n- could never picture anyone for him. I don't really picture actors when I'm writing. And then my friend Jen Rush, who has a book coming out next year called Altered, cast the book on her blog, and she put a model named Sean O'Pry on the cover of this fake magazine. And all I'll say is, Google Sean O'Pry. That is exactly who I picture. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, get out of my head, Jen. <laughs> yeah, so. um, how much research did you have to do in Russian culture, and language, and how did because I can't, I was reading this book, I don't even know, all the Grisha, all the Grisha, I can't even say them. Well, I, I guess I should explain that um, uh, the, the inspiration for this fantasy world was Tsarist Russia of the early 1800s. And, um, I mean, the first thing I would say is it's not Russia. So I was able to take a lot of liberties and did that deliberately. Um, Russian language can be incredibly opaque. I thought I was making it less opaque, but some people do not feel it's the case. Um, but uh, I did about two months of research. Um, I just wanted the world to feel tangible. I love um, high fantasy, but I feel like sometimes you'll pick up a high fantasy book and it'll be like, you know, Lord Kliegenflug of the Kingdom of Blagenfeld, you know, went long searching for the sword of Kinglu. And you're like, oh, great. So I wanted it to feel, um, I wanted it to feel familiar and textured and tangible. And um, so... You know, I research history and culture, and um, I have old Russian recipe books, and I actually have, um, I live in an area where there's a huge Russian expat population, um, and, and, and did my best to do it that way. Um, so, yeah. I will, there's actually a pronunciation guide on the website. Oh, there is. There is. You too can speak Russian. Right. 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 So that's for the rest of you. What one thing did you have from the research, the most impressive thing that you I decided to make this science fiction, and um, while I do not claim to understand much physics, I read a lot of random things like Stephen Hawking's The Brief History of Time. Now, Stephen Hawking is not somewhere reading this going, this woman is brilliant. <laughs> we really do have that with our whole world on a loom. Why didn't I think of this before? And he's planning his little documentary to do on it. That's, that's probably not happening. But I felt like if I was going to do science fiction, I needed to have some basic concept of quantum mechanics and various, like, string world theory and pocket universe theory and all these in-depth things that, that I could murder <laughs> in my own um, science fiction. So... I don't know. That's, I did a lot of that. And then I also would, like, rip up Pepper from that. So he was really useful to me. I would sit there and see how it would rip. And I pulled out one string. And it was it was pretty messy. It was the best day ever when my sister came over with an entire book of textile samples. And I was like, <laughs> and you would be this. No. So, yeah. That's really true. I did some research on Midway Brain. And one of my favorite parts of that was when I got to talk to a of who's a midwife. And I asked her to read the scenes in the novel that have birds in them. And I said, so would this work? Would this be right? And she had all of her midwife books with her. And we went and looked things up. She said, oh, I think she would use shepherd's park here. And oh, to be food co-hosts. And you have to be careful which co-hosts you talk about because some of them are more poisonous in different situations. And it was really, really useful to be able to run things by her. I had done a lot of research on my own beforehand with um, 
with the internet and having been a mom myself, I've had some experiences with childbirth. But it was really great to talk to a midwife. And she told me she was really happy that the book had scenes in it of normal women having normal births because she said often in, um, in television shows and in films, we focus on births that have gone wrong. And because that's we want, we want drama in our fiction and in our film. Um, so she said it was really, she was just really delighted to see some more normal births represented in fiction. And even though, well, I mean, some of them are actually, one of them is not very normal. There's a hanged woman who has to have a C-section after she's dead. So that's not really a normal childbirth. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, they're not all totally normal. But some of them are kind of normal. And it was really neat to talk to her. And since then, I've learned a lot more about midwifery. So it's been kind of cool to me to have people be drawn to that aspect of the book. My daughter's actually going to go into the work for you. She's going to find Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. yeah. 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 I gave that book to my midwife. Like, oh, no. Okay. That's cool. Yeah. See, things like that happen. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's apparently a really powerful community of women involved with the work and who are, they're interested in changing the laws regarding the work and, and access to good child health care for women who are pregnant, regardless of what their needs and desires are. So I, it's been really interesting. Thank you, Bradley. So, um, for my book, um, my, my main character, Darcy, is an artist. Um, I'm not an artist. And so, one of the things I did for research was to talk to somebody about oil painting. Um, I talked to my brother about what sort of tools Khan, who is a human in the story, what sort of tools he would use in the process of repairing a carburetor because he's mechanically inclined and also tinkers with and builds some pretty incredible machines. Um, And I also, in the process of thinking about what an alternate world would look like or what the rules would be, um, I had to think about what would happen in this alternate world with people who were actually born before the Great Chicago Fire. Um, And would would their lives take the same path as people in our world, you know, it's the same version. You know, if you had two versions of the same person living in, in separate worlds. Um, and so I did a little bit of research on artists, particularly, who were born before, before 1874. Um, and there's a chapter in the book which, um, in, which my, in which Darcy goes to an art museum in the alternate world and sees some um, art by artists who were born before in the fire, who lived in the alternate world, and the different shapes that their work took. So, for example, Rodin's um, The Thinker. Do you know that that's in culture? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, in the alternate world, it's called The Dreamer. And it's a sculpture. It's a sculpture of a man looking up rather than down. Thank you, Diane. Oh, you didn't get her touched for a while now, maybe? Okay, I lied. <laughs> 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 <laughs>